Thank you, Sergei. Um, I thought I'd start by mentioning, I mean, my, my talk is going to be much more autobiographical, how I got to know Dick and I was his pastor, and we collaborated on so many projects. When I, when I think about it, he was probably one of the most central personalities in my life. And, you know, and I, I didn't realize until he was gone. So, I mean, we were good friends, and I always enjoyed coming to Juno, and I was always welcomed and hosted in Dick and Nora's home. But um, his loss is really a, a tremendous loss for all of us. But I met him on a day of tragedy, actually. Um, I was teaching Yupik in the elementary school in Dillingham, Alaska, the other, the other side of the state completely. Uh, and that only happened by accident in a certain way. I, I was struggling to learn Yupik myself. That was my focus for the last several years. I moved into Queefook, Alaska, where my high school students had invited me. That's how I wound up in Queefook. There was no federal grant. There wasn't any, an NEH <laughs> funding behind this. But my high school students invited me. And I was staying in a one-room log cabin with an elderly couple who spoke no English at all. And that immersion is how I began my struggle to learn the Yupik language. And because of that, several years, I, when I moved to Dillingham as an earlier day priest, I started teaching Yupik to the Yupik kids who didn't speak Yupik. <laughs> because they knew English, I knew English. We shared the English language, and I kind of knew what would be tough as an English-speaking person moving into a Yupik culture and mastering the Yupik grammar. So I, I could break the Yupik down to the simplest but basic uh, elements. And I started just doing it at the church on Sunday afternoons. It was before TV. <laughs> the kids were bored. I had five kids the first week, 20 the next, 80 the next. <laughs> the school downtown was trying to find a bilingual teacher, unbeknownst to me, to teach Yupik. So they called me up, would you, want, would you like a job? I said, I have a full-time job. I have this parish in 14 other villages. I don't have time for anything else. They said, well, how about part-time in the afternoons when you're not busy at church? <laughs> okay. So I'm hired as the bilingual teacher for the Dillingham City School Districts, and we're having teacher training next week, October. It was this time of year. And uh, the, the training was going to be in the community hall, which is above the fire station. So Dick was one of the trainers. Irene Reed from the Language Center in Fairbanks and Dick were the two trainers for this language uh, tr teacher training. And halfway through that morning, the fire engines underneath us sounded their sirens, the alarms went off, and of course everything had to stop. There's a fire somewhere in, in town. And we pulled the curtains aside and someone yelled, Father Michael, it's your house. <laughs> well, I, I have a wife and at that time an infant daughter at home, so my heart sank, I rushed to the window, and then the wind shifted and it was clear that it wasn't my house, it was the neighbors across the street, which was also a great tragedy. That house had about a dozen high school boarding students sleeping there and uh, a husband, a wife, and three young children. But the children, the high school students were already at school. The elderly couple and their, and their, two of their three children were asleep in the house, and in that fire, the husband and the two boys perished. Mm -hmm. So it was the end of our training. I mean, there was no way to continue with, with the, you know, Yupik grammar and syntax anymore. But there was a memorial service at the church that evening, and everyone came, including Dick and Irene. Now, uh, we knew, I knew Irene much longer. She was, was of Finnish descent and a staunch Lutheran lady. But, but at this service, Dick participated fully. He sang along with the singers, as if he knew the music already. He venerated the icons. He received a blessing. Everybody was whispering, he's one of us, he's one of us. Well, after this, we invited him over to the house. And my uh, daughter, who was at that time maybe 10 months old, was in my arms. <coughs> And uh, he met my wife and Anastasia for the first time. And Anastasia picked up the cross that I was wearing. In fact, it's this one I brought it with me. And uh, almost as if she was blessing, <laughs> as if she were the priest. <laughs> and I, I didn't even notice this, except two weeks later, we got a poem in the mail. <laughs> the, the first Dick Dowenhauer poem written for anyone in my family. <laughs> and, and, and it's in the book, uh, Frames of Reference, and it's called Anastasia of the Resurrection. And I'll read it to you, because this is my first meeting with Dick, and it's also the first poem he wrote for anyone from my family. Anastasia of the Resurrection. Venerations first. The kissing of the cross, the icon, the child. 
Returning from a service for the dead, alive with images of children lost in flame, we greet the infants in her mother's arms. We venerate this image, too, the daughter from her father's chest, in her tiny grasp, lifting up the cross. That was my introduction, my introduction to Dick. <laughs> that incident and that poem. And so many of Dick's poems were inspired by his experience in the church. You, the titles of them alone indicate the feast day on which that particular uh, meditation was inspired. If you go through uh, his collection of poems, Friends of Reference alone, there are 16 poems whose titles include a reference to a church holiday and eight more with liturgical motifs embedded in them. Uh, titles like uh, Birth of the Theotokos, Litur Lit Liturgy of Snow, The Two Covenants, Feast of St. Michael, Nativity Icon, Holy In Innocence, The Four Feast of Theophany, which appears my, one of my favorite passages. This is just one of the verses from the Four Feast of Theophany, which you know is the holiday on which we bless water. It's very convenient in Greece in January to go to bless water on the 12th day of Christmas. In our tradition, the 12th day of Christmas is the baptism of the Lord. And so we have this tradition of blessing water, usually the outside the church, rivers, lakes, even the ocean, on what on the new calendar would be the 6th of January. On our old calendar in Alaska and Russia, it's the 19th. It's one of the most inconvenient days of the year to bless water. <laughs> in fact, we hardly have any water in liquid form outside. In fact, we never have water in liquid form outside on that holiday. So uh, it's a, something of a regression, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, you know, for the last 10 years in Western Alaska, we have been standing in opposition to the Pebble Project, the, large, the world's largest copper and gold open pit mine at the headwaters of the world's largest salmon fishery. And some years ago now, one of the main uh, opponents to the mine, a man with a lot of wealth, who also has a house in this region, called me up and said, how can we work together? <coughs> I have to admit, as a temptation, when a billionaire says, how can we work together? Your first inclination is to say, well, hire me as a consultant and I'll think about it for a while. <laughs> I, I didn't do that. I said, do you have an airplane? He said, I have seven, why? I said, because we have this custom of blessing water, and I'd like to bring the bishop up from California. We didn't have a resident bishop at that time in our state. <coughs> the local tenants, the temporary bishop, was in San Francisco. I'd like to bring him up and bless the water in this region threatened by the mine, and make it something of a public event. Not to make any political statement, but to say these waters are sacred to us. They have been sacred to us. It's exactly what Sergei was saying. By, because they were sacred to the indigenous people who have been there for, for millennia. And now they're sacred to us as Orthodox Christians because we've been invoking God's blessing on those lakes and rivers for the last 200 years. But let's highlight that as our, in a sense, stance against this, uh, this threat that will pollute, certainly, and poison precisely those lakes and rivers. So uh, the, the billionaire agreed to loan us a pilot and a plane. Then I called the bishop, or actually emailed him. Your Grace, uh, this is going to be logistically difficult, you know. It's going to be below zero. We have to fly into a, a small airport. Someone will have to prearrange to meet us because there won't be any telephones there. And we didn't have cell phones yet. Uh, and then the people will be, have to gather simultaneously at the church. And they'll bring us from the airport to the church. And then we'll go in procession down to the lake or the river. Someone will have to be there ahead of us to cut a hole in the ice and keep it from freezing over. And then we can bless the water. The bishop wrote back, hole in the ice. <laughs> <laughs> but we managed to do this, and, uh, and that's the holiday that inspired this particular um, uh, verse that I love so much, because this is the image of the people standing around that hole in the ice out on the lake or river. And of course, what's happening? Each human body becomes a living icon, encased with silver reza, of its own breath, exposing only face. You know what the Riza is. It's that silver cover like on Our Lady of Sitka. It was a, a, an art form in 18th, 19th century Russia to cover especially venerable old icons with these, this silver covering uh, to protect it because they didn't have good glass. <laughs> now that we have glass, we don't bother with the silver coverings. But the, the notion of each human person, a living icon covered in the silver, created by 
their own breath is just one of Dick's most amazing poetic metaphors, images. Um, my favorite poem, however, comes from his uh, meditation on death itself. Uh, there are other po poems with the titles Good Friday Snowstorm, Russian Easter, Transfiguration, Feast of the Dormition, Anastasia of the Resurrection, Divine Liturgy at St. Elias Orthodox Church, or Prelude, or Glad Some Light, or On the Death of Parents, from which, which I'll read to you. Because, in a sense, dealing with the death of his own parents, Dick was also preparing for his own. The myth of life, to overcome death, one cannot avoid it. From Genesis we learn death is not of God, but an insult in the face of God. And we are justified in anger, anchored in hope. A Hindu comparison, changing carts, a passenger transfers on a bus without attachment to vehicle. As Christians, we believe God suffered and died. We try to understand this. Yet as humans, we try to be exempt but on the model of innocent divinity, there is no exemption from the bitter cup and no exclusion from the empty tomb. If we had a memorial gathering for, for Dick at the library, the Lucette Library in Anchorage, and this was one aspect of his life that no one touched upon because it was dismissed as 150 years of slavery. But, but there were schools, and that people were learning to read and write, and their languages and cultures were being documented, and they were becoming their own teachers and producing their own. This was all revolutionary. It was revolutionary for me, too. I didn't know anything about this. It was really Dick who introduced me to this whole theme. It eventually became a doctoral dissertation, but I wouldn't have known anything about it in the first place if Dick hadn't introduced me to this whole uh, historical experience. So he was among the first to document the multilingual literacy among Alaska Native communities. Uh, and it, in fact, when I began to research it, I must say this is something really extraordinary about him. He was so happy to find somebody else who was interested in it, he passed the baton. I got, you know, he had 50 irons and 20 fires. He was interested in so many other things. When he found a student who could be enthusiastic about any one of his projects, he happily handed it over to them and allowed them to run with it and gave them all the encouragement he could. So many academics tend to be territorial with their research topic. This is my area, stay out of it. That was never the case with him. He was always happy to find a student who, in, who got just as excited, as excited as he was, and then he, he let you run with it. And that, that's really what I look back on, what, what his greatest gift probably to me personally was because he gave me so many, so many ideas, and then he'd, give me, he'd footnote me in his next edition. <laughs> so if you look at conflicting landscapes, it's the original text, and then there's pages and pages of footnotes giving credit to me for the research I've done. But I never would have done any of that research if I hadn't read the original monograph that he produced. So you see, it was this cross-fertilization for which I can be so eternally grateful. Um, Finally, we have to say something about his life in the church. Uh, he wasn't just an historian in secular areas. He wrote the history of St. Nicholas Church here in Juneau, a little chapel that he deeply loves. I think he and Ria Munoz <laughs> love that building the most. <laughs> he was a member, a founding member of the Friends of St. Nicholas with Kathy Ruddy and uh, Rick Yanolino and others here in this community who were struggling to keep that 120-year-old wooden building uh, standing. <laughs> you know, it's hard to keep old wooden buildings <laughs> uh, sturdy and, and sound in our climate here in Southeast Alaska. So the Friends of St. Nicholas were responsible for one of the many res renovations up there on the hill. On the 100th anniversary of the church, uh, he was instrumental in researching and publishing a, a history of that community. With all, and he was responsible for, for nearly all the photographs in it, all the historical photographs. It was one, another one of his historical projects where it overlaps with his commitment to the Orthodox faith. But uh, probably besides the, um, <coughs> besides the recording of the church music and his 
regular participation in the life of the church and the sacraments of the church and the holidays of the church, which in themselves inspired so much of his poetry, um, did, did something really uh, uh, amazing, I think, and it, it ties in with our theme here, how his a deep interest and love of Clinton language and culture and Native American spirituality overlapped and dovetailed with his love of Christ and the church. And that, the expression of that, I think, is best uh, exemplified in a project that he undertook pretty much on his own. He commissioned uh, his own mother-in-law, Nora's mom, Emma Marks, uh, to make a series of uh, Clinton style beadwork animals, plants, flowers, fish, ravens, eagles, bears, none of them uh, atu, none of them official Tlingit uh, clan insignia, but nevertheless in that style. And then he uh, engaged my wife, so it was, a, it was a family project between the two of us, to make a set of vestments in which all the Tlingit artwork, all the beadwork, the plants and the animals of this region would be glorified in a set of vestments that could be worn before the altar. It's the only one like it in the world. It, it, it went on more, it's probably been in more museum exhibits than, in, than any priest's shoulders. <laughs> because it was such an example of precisely this combination of the two worlds, the two cultures, that uh, it was taken to Washington DC and toward the United States and all around Alaska and it, no one ever wore it. It was a personal gift to, to Father Nicholas Harris, the, uh, the um, dean of the cathedral in Anchorage. And so when Father Nicholas retired, of course it was his, so he took it with him. So otherwise I could have borrowed it from the cathedral and, and brought it here to show you, if you hadn't seen it before. But um, Father Nick lives in Florida, and it wasn't exactly um, accessible. But then I remember just this morning, I celebrated Easter, Pascha, with Father Nick last year. May, last April, and I took a picture of him. And I do have a picture of Father Nick wearing his vestments. They're very heavy. They're, they were meant for Alaska. I don't know how often he wears them in Florida, actually. But there was no way he was going to leave them behind, because it was so typical of, of Dick that this had to be a personal gift, not just a, a, an, art, a, an art form. It had to be a personal gift for the man who received him into the church, who, um, whom he admired and loved so well. And so Father Harris has these. I, like I said, I don't know how often he wears them in Florida, but I met him in Pennsylvania where it was plenty chilly enough for him to make use of the creation of the world uh, Orthodox vestments. Uh, they appear in uh, Russian America, the Forgotten Frontier, at the very end. Uh, that's a black and white picture. But I also have a color picture of this extraordinary and absolutely unique set of uh, priest vestments that are both trinket and Orthodox. In a sense, it's the most visual memorial we have of Dick. His love of the Tlingit culture and language and his love of the church combined into an absolutely unique art form that is now sacred and holy. One last thing. I don't think it's a, it's a coincidence. The older I get, the less I believe in coincidence. Things just happen as they're meant to be. Um, there are two of them, and I'll finish with these two anecdotes. The cross that I showed you was actually made of moose antler. It's also unique and probably only one like it. And a, another priest, an older priest, my wife's cousin's husband, a relative, gave it to me on the day of my ordination. And this is the cross that my daughter raised and Dick wrote his first poem about. You can see it's not on a chain because about 12 years ago I was visiting Kuwait, look, my wife's village, and one of my sister-in-law's grandchildren was getting rather rambunctious and I kind of picked him up and I was playing with him. And he was still rambunctious, and he got a, good, got a hold of this cross and gave it a good pull, and all the beads on which it hung broke, and the beads were all over the floor, and I picked up the cross, and my sister-in-law said, well, let me put it up here. You'll know where it is when you leave. Don't forget to take it with you. Well, I was there another week. The week went by, went to get the cross. It wasn't there. It was missing, completely gone. She said, well, then one of the kids might have gotten it, or it fell behind somewhere. I'll, uh, I'll find it, and next time you'll get it. Well, a decade went by, she searched the house everywhere, never found the cross. A year ago, my brother-in-law, who lives up the street from the sister-in-law, uh, came to my house and said, you know, the funniest thing happened. I was, I was miles from the village out hunting. I was setting up my tent to spend the night, and as I sat down on the tundra, I, I found a cross. And I took it home, and I left it there for a couple of years, and then I thought, well, why, 
why should I just let it sit there in the corner? I might as well wear it. And so my son said, well, Uncle Max, uh, are you wearing it now? Yeah. And he pulled it out. How it got miles from the village, I have no idea. Moose lose their antlers on a regular basis, but they dissol the antlers dissolve into the tundra. What are the chances of anyone finding a moose antler cross anywhere out on the tundra? What are the chances of that person being from Quetzal? What are the chances of that person from Quetzal being related to me? What are the chances of that person from Quetzal putting it on and bringing it back to my house? It's, uh, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? And here it is, the cross about which Dick wrote in his first book. Dick fell asleep in the Lord on the feast of the transfiguration of Christ. His funeral was on another major feast of the church, the Dormition of the Mother of God. His 40th day, the 40th day after his repose, was the feast of the elevation of the cross. Only God could have arranged it that way. And so I repeat, as I see Dick's life, it is this combination, this flowing together of traditional Clinkett Native American spirituality and Orthodox Christianity that has now been blessed and sanctified by God. May his memory be eternal.